And it might be a more useful conversation to discuss why we use ornamentation instead of where we use it. And that's what I'm going to cover in this video. Something that I get asked a lot is how do you know when to put ornamentation into a tune? Where do you place the triplets and the trebles and the harmony notes and slides and runs of stuff and all of that? And the simple answer is I've been doing it for so long that it happened naturally, but that's not a very <laughs> helpful answer, right? Uh, I started playing when I was eight or nine years old. And of course, once you learn ornamentation at that age, you just want to put it in everywhere. So there's no doubt that there were periods of my life when I was guilty of putting ornamentation in at every conceivable possible opportunity, and then some. And out of that whole process, and that's perfectly normal uh, development as a musician, somewhere along the line that develops into a style. But for those of us who are learning maybe as an adult or have only been playing for a number of years, uh, telling you that, uh, you know, playing for 40 years and, and then you'll develop your style is probably not a very helpful thought. So we are going to discuss the kind of the basic theory of where to put ornamentation. And it might be a more useful conversation to discuss why we use ornamentation instead of where we use it. And that's what I'm going to cover in this video. So we need to base it on a tune because that's the easiest way to do it. So I've picked a relatively simple and well-known tune called Sporting Paddy. It's in the key of A minor. On Sound Slice, I'm going to write out the simple notation of the tune so that you can learn it with no ornamentation. But now, for the purposes of this, I'm going to discuss where, when, how, and most importantly, perhaps, why I use ornamentation. So the simplest starting point is to play a one note treble on long notes, essentially on those whole notes or crotchet notes. Uh, I get very confused when the terminology pops up because what I call a whole note is a crotchet, but I believe somebody else that might be a minimum, a minimum, a minimum, even. <laughs> but let's say we're playing a reel. There are uh, eight notes in the bar, and to my mind, there were always eight half notes. Huh? But anyway, they're quavers. And there's eight of them, and when we come along uh, a crotchet, uh, that's a long note. Right, and that's where we start putting in triplets. So, Sporting Paddy. So essentially, that's the most basic version of the tune where the long notes just present themselves as an opportunity to put in a triplet. But there's an awful lot more opportunities to put in triplets. And the question is, where, where do we find them and how do we perhaps even orchestrate them? So the very first bar of the tune has a couple of repeated A notes. And one thing we can do with that is that we can we can create space for a treble there. Second half of Sporting Paddy has lots of long notes. So there's lots of very obvious places that we can create room for a triplet or for a treble in Sporting Paddy. I'm going to jump ahead now because before we get into um, you know different ways to create opportunities or space in a tune for ornamentation I'm going to go jump right to the end of the story and story is a very good word 
because why are we using ornamentation at all? It's an ornament, which by definition is something that embellishes or makes a tune nicer. But we can over-ornament and over-embellish, and then we start to lose the nature of the tune, perhaps. And it becomes more about the ornamentation than it does become about the soul of the tune. So, what I'm always trying to create with the banjo is a number of things. One, on a musical level, is to make a piece of music interesting, in the sense that it almost tells a story. Number two, is that I'm always looking for a way to create a phrase. On the banjo there is no natural breath or no natural phrase. And if you're playing the fiddle, the bow has to change direction. If you're playing accordion, there's the in and out push. Same is true on concertina. If you're playing the flute, you clearly have to take a breath. And those places where the direction changes, there's a natural, there's a natural breath that occurs in the tune. But the banjo, and I'm going to do it now just for demonstration purposes, we could play Sporting Paddy with the consistent alternate down-up-down down picking right the way through it and never take a breath. And this is what it sounds like. say your picking is excellent volume tone excellent but there's no phrase there's no interest so that's the number two reason that i use ornamentation is to create phrases i'm going to talk about that in a second and the third reason is it's linked to the phrasing but one thing that banjo can suffer from because of a whole range of factors number one i always feel is tension and poor technique is that it can have that really metronomic, I call it machine gun rhythm, da -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da -ga, right? And that doesn't relate whatsoever to the lovely lyrical swing, ebb and flow that we know from great fiddle playing, great accordion playing, great flute playing. And how does the banjo fit into all of this? And so this is like, a complicated way of saying we're going to use ornamentation and we know we're going to learn where to use it but first we have to understand what the end product is and the end product is a piece of music that ebbs and flows that has tension and release that has breath that has phrasing and that uh, has has lovely rhythm and so the ornamentation can embellish the basic tune in order to achieve a very nice piece of music and that's why I use ornamentation, or at least that's my goal with ornamentation. So let's look at the first part of the tune, bearing all of those ideas in mind, and let's see what happens. Now, there's a lot going on there. There's little chromatic triplets, there's run-ups, there's pauses. Pauses are very important. A pause in a note is an ornament in the sense that you're changing the tune and putting in a long note where perhaps it wasn't in the original melody, so it counts as ornamentation. My favourite things to do are the run-up triplets. Those are the moments that they round off the hard edges of the banjo rhythm, the down up, down up, down up, down up, down up. That can we can we can fall into the tendency of playing like that, and so those run-up and run-down triplets are very good at creating curves. There's a bounce and there's a swing that starts to come into it when you use ornamentation in this way. In that first part, jumping off the G note that happens after a couple of bars, 
I think that's a very important point because this is the breath that we are going to create. It's the phrase. So that happens like this. And essentially the tune, if you think about it, is going back and over between the and then it moves upwards in the melody and we put in a little breath or a break before it goes up. And so that's starting to create almost like the storytelling mode, which is that it's a call and answer. All right. So you have this repeated heavy rhythm that starts at the at the beginning of that first part and then as it gets lighter towards the end we put a we just put a pause in between those two moments so that's a great a great example of using just a long note or a pause to split the two parts of the tune and to create a phrase and to create a little narrative and, uh, and, and to put a breath into the tune. So we can double down on the rhythm of that first repeated part by using lots of ornamentation. And this is one of the ways that we can use a lot of trebles or a lot of one note triplets in order to accentuate the, the rep repetitious nature of that first part. And then we're going to lighten it out at the end with the three note triplet runs. So this is an example of how that sounds. All right, so the start is heavy on the downbeats and heavy on the one note triplets. So we're really bringing out the strong rhythm. All right. So we've just talked about making the first part of the first part quite metronomic and leading on the downbeat and using lots of one note triplets to really bring out the strong rhythm and then contrasting that with some run up and run down triplets in the second part of that first half of the tune. The second part of the tune can be very strong rhythmical uh, playing as well and if we do that we might want to make the first part more lyrical. So I'm going to show you some options on how to do that. Firstly Let's do the second part in a very rhythmical fashion. In essence, what we're doing is we're really trying to build the tension up as much as possible in the second half. And we do that by layering lots of downbeats and lots of triplets. We even finish with a run of tremolo. So what we want to do is try and make the first part more lyrical. And to do this, I'm going to use some chromatic rundown triplets um, and try to try to get off the heavy downbeats of the tune uh, by uh, and essentially using triplets to pull away from the downbeats. They're a lot of fun to play. Slight little bit of uh, blues uh, notes thrown in there because of the F natural. So it's essentially about creating contrast. We can create contrast by doing lots of one note triplets and then doing uh, the three note run up and run down triplets and there's a lot of contrast between that. We can also leave out the ornamentation entirely or almost entirely for one part and then load up on ornamentation the next time round, and that creates contrast too. So here's an example of that.
but essentially what we're doing here is like real simplicity followed by you know lots and lots of, of ornamentation and, and putting them in as much as possible particularly in that second half which is a lot of fun Like this got very complicated very quickly broken down all of this is very very simple uh, but maybe you know to make a point about the contrast and the storytelling and the phrasing uh, I'm using lots and lots of ornamentation so it's definitely worthwhile looking at a simpler version of the tune to show that you don't have to ornament every single note which I'm doing right now for illustration purposes but you can keep it quite simple and tasty but still use the ornamentation to tell a story. And maybe that's what we'll try now. Got a bit complicated again, didn't I? <laughs> I get excited. Here's a very slow playthrough, just so that we can get all of the notes together and all of the ornamentation together, because I, I have been playing it quite fast. I hope that wasn't too complicated, too convoluted. It's a very difficult topic to say you should definitely put a treble here and a triplet here and a chord here and a pause here. It's more about offering a whole load of different ideas. And, you know, maybe if you're on Sound Slice and you can take the notation of this, pull out a couple of bars that you like, learn them off. If you do that enough times, you'll just start to feel where to put it in the next tune. But that's essentially what happened for me. I'm nine years old, I'm learning how to play, I'm 11, putting in loads of triplets, I'm 15, I'm putting them all in, and then they just start to fall into other tunes. Um, it's, uh, it's habit, it's practice, it's familiarity, and it's also just allowing yourself the freedom to hear the music that you're playing. That's a very important um, skill in itself, which 
when you're playing to hear what you're playing it's one of the ways to listen for listen out for the phrasing to listen out for the story of the tune and i do understand that when we're very focused on technique or learning the tune or we're very focused on getting the triplets right or is my picking correct we get very small and right in the instrument and it's hard to step outside that and to hear the music as you're playing it and that's a skill in itself something to be developed it's to get familiar with a tune and then to drop inside allow it to be played and allow yourself to listen when you do that then you'll start to hear the phrase you'll start to anticipate it you'll start to hear the ornamentation and anticipate that And it's not that you're two bars ahead of yourself, but that you're just allowing the music to be played. And then everybody will play it differently. That's the beauty of style and individuality. And I did a video on it before. (laughs) Sing along with yourself as you're playing it. Sound a little bit ridiculous, but it's also a lot of fun. The crazy thing about it is that as you lilt the tune... You will lilt the ornamentation as you play it. You will lilt the phrasing as you play it. The two happen together, which makes logical sense because it's just the one entity that's doing both. But for some reason, it feels like a surprise when the picking hand is doing the same as the singing voice. Uh, I have a video on this about how to get nya, how to get the rhythm and the flow into, into a tune. And I say, you know, picture yourself as an old man in a, or an old lady, in a country pub in Connemara. And someone says, do you know Sport and Paddy? Will you lilt it for me? And they go, of course I do. Second half is too high for me. But you get the idea. Is that... I believe everybody can inherently do that by voice. And if you can do it by voice, you can do it on the banjo. And if you have the courage (laughs) and a quiet house where no one is listening, to do it together, it'll come out in your hands. Every time I do it, I'm like, oh, my hands are doing the same as my my mouth. (laughs) What a surprise, but it's not really. I think that might be the secret sauce here, you know. Just try it and have a bit of fun with it. What's the worst that can happen? Someone will hear you. (laughs) 